And here you see the, a demonstration of just how quickly these loads could be transferred because one particular vehicle has just made its way out now, we can imagine it's dropped it at the back of the station and into the, uh, into the goods area comes another mechanical horse to pick this body up and take it elsewhere. This was the beginning of articulated haulage as we understand it in this country because articulated vehicles pretty well up until this time, and the example we're seeing now is the post-war, we've seen the pre-war one, was the post-war 1944, owned by Mr. Downs from uh, Knightley up there in West Yorkshire, and uh, we're seeing now an example of just how these articulated demountable trailers would operate. This was Scammell's own coupling, not only did they build the, the tractor units, build the trailers, but they also designed the couplings as well. And it's showing you here the versatility of these little vehicles. They could be used in very, very confined spaces and be used to uh, move these interchangeable, demountable trailers. Because by, by and large, articulated vehicles until this time were simply vehicles that bent in the middle. They didn't drop the articulated section. The articulated section was a permanent fixture, or at very least, semi-permanent. Now, we haven't got a car for this one. It's 335, but we're getting a little bit more modern, as you can see. And this is one from Mr. Jordan's collection. Uh, you'll find that over on the far side of the arena, uh, at the back of the Mechanical Horse Club's exhibit. And you can see now, we've got slightly larger. We've got the, the larger trailer with the more recent uh, vehicle here with the upgraded engine. These were still a very, very popular and very sensible type of load carrier for the type of work for which they were designed. However, at the end of the day, it was the legislation at the time, traffic legislation that made all the difference and we were no longer able to use these legally in the road, on the road. And now the 1967 Scammell Scarab from Mr. Summerfield at Liverpool is uh, number 299 which is coming past the arena now and you'll see that this is the last one uh, in the arena in this three-wheeled Scammell section here. Once again a very, very manoeuvrable little vehicle. This wasn't the last Scammell of this type produced, there was a, a fiberglass cab variant that came along a little bit after this. And when you're looking at the cab design, it's interesting to note they're actually using the uh, same type of cabs, in fact they are, they're old Bedford cabs supplied uh, from a defunct, uh, the M and the K series Bedford that has long since gone out of production. Hello, my name's Barry Hurd. I'm just going to interrupt John Collins, who is giving this fine commentary for a few seconds to explain that we're at the Dorset Steam Fair, where every year an amazing collection of classic commercial vehicles is brought together, and we're going to watch a good few of them as they parade through the arena. Having said that, I'm going to hand you back now to the extremely knowledgeable John Collins, who is going to talk you through the rest of this programme. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy the show. And now, moving down towards us here at the commentary point is something totally different. And we pick up the Land Rover story again. This is the 1963 Land Rover, Mr. Spracken from Wareham. And uh, he's number 145 in your programme. Very nicely presented, as you can see. Once again, the Land Rover, it's a no-nonsense workhorse. Yes, we're back to four-wheel drive. But they did all sorts of things with their forward control Land Rovers before they the forward control V8 versions that we've seen probably going around with the military this afternoon. I would assume we've seen at least one in the military parade. I wasn't watching, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure there's some here. There's some examples here, there must be. We also had the four-cylinder and the six-cylinder uh, engine civilian versions. And here we have part of the forward control Land Rover story. They were a completely different vehicle to the, the military version that you would have more than likely seen in the military parade already this afternoon. And now coming down towards us is one of those vehicles that history isn't immediately apparent because when Dave Harrod, who owns this vehicle, purchased the vehicle, all he had was a cab and a chassis. And he didn't have any information about it at all. Uh, he didn't really know any of the previous history. And so you, you have to look elsewhere. And it's the registration number that gave the clue to this one. And, uh, oh, there she is. I'm glad you could make it this afternoon. You're so much better looking than he is. It's the, it's the registration number that gave the clue to the history of this vehicle because 
That registration number belongs to a block of registrations that were purchased and issued by the BBC. And this particular vehicle, when it was new, was a generator truck for the BBC, and its history has been established. It was one of the uh, one of its last jobs actually was supplying power for uh, the outside broadcast units that covered uh, Winston Churchill's funeral. It's a very nice example there of the Austin Lodestar. When it started life, it's a drop side today, but when it started life, it was a generator truck for the BBC. Now this vehicle that we're looking at now, making its way towards us, hasn't changed at all since it started life in 1966. It's the Bedford TK flatbed, and if you notice, it's got uh, quite an extension out over the cab, a bed extension over the cab, but it's not for carrying weight. This extension was really for putting the tilt up there, it was owned by a market gardener. It's owned today by Mr. Vader from Heathfield in East Sussex. But the sign writing on the side is the original sign writing. If you look carefully, the history is backed up because of the, the half bushel boxes on the back there. That's those little slatted boxes on the back. Actually, have got the same number on, the same name on their baker's name. And these, this vehicle was used to carry vegetables from the market garden in, in Surrey to the wholesale markets of Covent Garden in London. And up there above the cab, on that body extension above the cab, would have been kept the tarpaulin that would have rolled back over the load to keep the vehicles, out, the, the vegetables out of the wind while they were being freighted on this vehicle to the London market. Now well, number 63, and we're staying with Bedford, and this is the 1952. These are back before the, the TK that we've just seen go past us, the 1952, and this is the K-type. It's using the same cab, actually, before the back half of the windscreens as those little mechanical horses we've just seen. And it's the K-type bed with Mr. Parker from Holstead in Essex. Very nice example there. Once again, with this type of bodywork on there, you would have found one of these smaller bedfords probably working for costermongers out of the London wholesale market. Very nice as an example, a 30 weight, that's a one and a half ton carrying capacity vehicle with the 28 horsepower petrol engine which was common to that whole range. The 1951, that number 58 that we have coming up towards us now, the uh, 1951 version, Mr. James from Salisbury, you'll see from your program that it's a tipper, and this one actually is a tipper. The tipping gear doesn't work from a ram that goes up the back of the cab. It's um, one of those completely hidden tipping up mechanisms underneath the bodywork that comes up and tips the whole bodywork up but we're not going to do it today because as you can see he's also got a Ferguson tractor on board. As Mr. James from Salisbury brings us a 1951 version of the Bedford uh, 28 horsepower petrol again. The major vast majority of these vehicles use that engine. Some of them were actually powered by the Perkins P6, but the very vast majority were Bedford's own 28 horsepower engine. And then coming down towards us is the 1960. We move forward 10 years from the early 1950s, the 1960 Comma Ballast Tractor. And this one's owned by the Bourne family from Hailsham in East Sussex. It's along here this weekend. It's the first ballast tractor in the arena, and there's quite a number of ballast tractors out there on the showground. What's a ballast tractor, you may say? Well, it's uh, when we're in talking about road haulage and we talk about a tractor, we talk about a vehicle which is designed to drag something along behind it. Not by superimposition, as uh, you would find the, an articulated vehicle is with the trailer fixed up on the top, on the top over a fifth wheel coupling at the, above the back axle. But a ballast tractor actually designed to hook a trailer on the back and just drag a dangler up the road. And this is the comma ballast tractor here, which is here this weekend in company with its owner's living wagon, in which they live at the show. Uh, can we have the numbers in plain display, please, David? Can you check they've got their numbers up, please, as they come in? Thank you very much indeed. 1961 Scammell Highwayman now, and this is uh, Molly Rawlings Scammell, and uh, she's owned this for a, quite a number of years now. It's been in the family for even longer than Molly's had it to look after. It's the 1961 Scammell Highwayman, and once again, we were talking about registration numbers, weren't we? Well, if we look at the registration of this one, We'll know straight away it's an ex-petroleum tanker, uh, probably for SO or it could have been Shell Max. But the majority of these uh, BGO numbers were used for petroleum transport. And you may wonder, think it's in a bit of a state going around the arena today. Well, it's nice to see the vehicle. 
Yeah, and you as well, Peter. Yeah. It's nice to see a vehicle looking like this because it underlines the fact that um, so many of these beautifully restored vehicles that we see at the shows, they don't just come out of a shoebox wrapped in tissue paper, you know, all ready like this. Somebody has to take a lot of trouble to restore them, preserve them, and present them to the public in the pristine condition in which so many of them appear at these events. And this vehicle is undergoing its second restoration in the uh, its ownership in the in the Rawlings family, and uh, it's being restored while it's rallied this year. And that's being followed by the 1959 Scammell Hand Highwayman tractor, Mr. Francis from Ashington in West Sussex. You'll notice a slight cab difference here because there's uh, far more fiberglass in the second cab than there was in the first cab going round. Well, this was Scammell's getting slightly more modern. But inside of that cab, it's still very, very pre-war and primitive indeed. And the mechanics there, it's got the old Gardner six-cylinder diesel engine and Scammell's very own gearbox, six-speed gearbox, and all the requisite holes in the floor where the draft whistles up your trouser leg as you drive along. They are very, very primitive indeed, but these were front-line haulage vehicles right through the 1960s, believe it or not. At a time when these Atkinsons first came out, and this is a 19... This one, although it's a 72 Atkinson, the forerunners of this vehicle was coming out in the 1960s. And this is the Atkinson Border Attractor. It's owned by Mr. McDonald from Croydon. This vehicle has been completely restored. I think it's about the fourth year it's been here down, down at Dorset now. Fifth year, fifth year, where do the years go? And, uh, yeah, you people get older every year. <laughs> At least I've still got all mine. But, but before we come to blows, it's uh, a very fine example of an Atkinson tractor unit restored not over the top and not in a way which it would not have been seen in the 1970s. This is exactly lettered correctly and presented the way a road haulage vehicle would have been seen out on the road in the 1970s. And now we're moving back in time again because we've gone back to Scammells again and it's 1942. And uh, here we have the Scammell Pioneer from 1942, very much a wartime Scammell, and it's still owned by Boscombe Down down there in Wiltshire and they come up every year to us at the Great Doors at Steam Fair. As you can see, it's had some slight modification done to the cab over the years. It's got rather a, a plush windscreen fitted and it's been tidied up a little bit and probably made a little bit more draft proof but it's still very very much the good old regular scammel. And underneath whatever little modern bits have been attached over the years as the other pieces have worn out, it's still basically exactly the same as it was back in the 1940s. And this was our recovery vehicle for the armed services as far as this country was concerned, in this range of uh, weight recovering right through the Second World War. And now, moving on again in time, we've seen the 1940s Scammell Pioneer. Well, this is the 1951 Scammell Explorer, owned by Mr. Germany from Isleworth in Middlesex. And uh, you'll notice there that the, the driver isn't the, the person in the cab sitting nearest the door. The driver's sitting more towards the centre. You can get quite a crew in the cab of these vehicles. But this in his essentially is a Scammell Pioneer, except it's been re-engineered. It now has six sets of brakes instead of just four. It drives on all six uh, wheels instead of just four of them. And uh, it's been upgraded mechanically. Uh, when they're in service, they're running on a very large petrol engine, where of course most of them have been converted since then. But essentially, the back end's just the same. That little tiny crane is not rated for heavy recovery. It's only a three-ton crane after all. The strength of this vehicle is in that beautiful scammer winch which lays underneath. It's a recovery vehicle that relies on its winching capability. And now number 212, the 1973 Bedford. We're talking about the Bedford J, J series. Well, here's the J4. And Mr. Pokara from Brockham in Surrey has brought this one along. And this one's getting a little bit more tidy every year as he comes around with this vehicle. Very, very much the type of vehicle that the AA put on their road rescue services uh, as soon as the spectacle lift option came out. Because modern vehicles, you can't hang the modern car on a crane because if you do, it'll bend in the middle. Or, at worst, it'll snap in half. You have to use a spectacle lift and stick your front two wheels into those um, funny little square 
uh, carriers there, which are up in the air on the back at the moment, because they're laid on the ground. You put, put the vehicle into that and then just lift it up underneath. So it's a sort of a semi-suspended stone with lifting from underneath. And that's the spectacle lift there. Very much the type of thing that you would have found using by the man who, the very nice man who knows from the AA. I know we've seen the Austin Lone Star. Well, this is virtually the Morris equivalent now, 170. Mr. Parker from Bletchworth in Surrey with the 1967 and it's the WFK100. And this is a bonneted control, the FK, um, this is the WFK as you see, with the forward control, bonneted control version here. And a very smart looking vehicle indeed. We don't see so many of these with the Morris badge on, but it's a very nice example. As you can see, he's uh, actually brought his living accommodation around the arena with him as well. Uh, I'd go for a five ton carrying capacity on this one. We don't have any notes. Uh, none of the commentators here this afternoon have been working on notes. We've just got the names and the vehicle. And uh, so we, we make the rest of it up as we go along. Which I'm sure must be very apparent to everyone who's listening. Yes! And there, another Scammell approaches us now, the Scammell Highwayman. But uh, this one, if you look at it carefully, you'll instinctively notice there's something slightly different about it. Uh, this one's owned by Mr. Stunt from Winborn, and uh, if you look at it, you think, well, there's something a little bit different about this vehicle, and of course it's the wheelbase. It's that shade longer. This isn't the normal highwayman, this is the long wheelbase version, mainly used uh, for export orders. Scammell had a very, very uh, strong export market, and this is an export vehicle. Quite a number of the export vehicles didn't actually get abroad. The air orders were cancelled, and so they were sold off in the UK. And some of them were uh, even returned after their period of service overseas. But here's an example. I think there's only a couple of these in the country, actually, if memory serves me right, of the longer wheelbase export model Scammell Highwayman there from 1967. Mechanically, otherwise, it's the same as any other uh, Highwayman. And now back to the 1950s, because here we've got the vehicle that everybody likes to poke fun at. Because um, when you're talking about elderly vehicles, straight away, somewhere along the line, you start thinking about the eccentric, and as soon as you start thinking about eccentric vehicles, you can't help thinking about Jowett. Because Jowett's actually were on the cutting edge of technology. They really produce marvellous vehicles. But the little Bradford was something completely extraordinary. And underneath the engine there is a two-cylinder, horizontally opposed engine, um, which uh, plods along quite happily in its own power range. It's not an excessively fast vehicle. For 1951, it looks more like 1935. But um, it's a very reliable, a very sturdy little vehicle, and a lovely little family vehicle. These were a utility, quite often used, uh, very much like a family estate car would be today. And a very nice example of a, a very economical to run uh, side, uh, horizontally opposed two-cylinder engine. And if you've no idea what one of those looks at, well, go and see the man when he parks up. I'm sure he'll lift the bonnet up to show you the ingenuity of the of the Jarrett engineers when they built these engines. Jarrett, of course, went out of motor production but carried on producing engines for all sorts of uses. And now we move on to 1957, because we have an AEC single deck bus, the AEC Reliance, Mr. Yarnall from St. Leonard's on Sea, back with us again this year. And uh, this particular vehicle will have an AEC diesel engine powering away in there. And it's quite right to describe this vehicle here as the single decker bus because if you look inside it's not a coach coaches were a bit flusher than this this was a service vehicle and it was the type of thing that you would have stuck your hand out to stop at a bus stop anywhere in the Maidstone district bus service area very well presented exactly the way it would have been when it was on service now it's a 1957 and now Mr Ian Hayes from Oakhampton down there in Devon brings us this year his 1960 Comma Carrier Motorhome. And this is a very nice example, very interesting registration as you can see. 
I haven't seen this, I think this is the vehicle that was built possibly for a doctor, if memory serves me right, for special order. But certainly, Common did provide this cab and chassis to a number of coach builders, and this wasn't unique, there were a number of motorhomes built on this particular chassis, but it is a very, very nice example of a very unusual vehicle. Undergoing restoration, as you can see, and I, as I say, I think this one was produced in a special order of a, of a doctor. But it's undergoing restoration, and it's not a caravan fitted on the back. This is as it had been built in 1960, with that uh, very, very typical comma cab on the front. And you'll notice it, in, it in fact is a left-hand drive. So obviously built for continental tourists. And now we're back to Atkinson's again, and the Atkinson Borderer, still powered by the Gardner diesel engine. Making its way towards us here at the commentary point, number 205 in your program, Mr Fitzhugh from Northampton, with his 1972 Atkinson Borderer. This one, as you can see, would have started life as an articulated tractor unit, working on the uh, long distance haulage up and down the motorways of this country but later on was uh, converted for timber work. This is a timber crane, it's not a recovery crane. You can see by the pattern of the jib. It's not a recovery crane, it's, uh, it's a timber crane although not a terribly heavy timber crane I must say but um, perhaps it had a specialist use. Perhaps it was used pulling out Christmas trees, I don't know. But it, it's uh, a timber crane as opposed to a recovery crane with its own donkey engine in the back. Nice, a 1972 Atkinson Border. And now, very proud of being British, as you can see, the 1963 Ford, the six-wheel recovery vehicle, owned by Mr. Bocking from Lydney, up there in Gloucestershire. This particular vehicle attends rallies up and down the country, just about everywhere you can go. Uh, Mr. Bocking turns up with his 1963 Ford, uh, where did I see this one last? I think it was up at Banbury, I'm not sure. I've got a feeling it was up at the Banbury Rally. Because we did a bit of, a bit of a phone parade up there at Banbury. But there's the very nice example of the six-wheel recovery vehicle from 1963. Properly equipped, as you can see, and uh, well set out. And uh, with all the gear on the back, it's got the solid drawbar as well, so if he gets stuck with his Ford Pop, he can always get it home. <laughs> 1962 now, and the Land Rover is 109-inch drop side. Mr. Stuart Hibbert from Fording Bridge. Now, if you want to know anything about Land Rovers, Mr. Hibbert's a man to ask. Um, because he'll fill you in on all the details that most other people have forgotten. And this is the 1962 version of the 109 inch drop side. Now we've seen one going round which looked virtually identical earlier. But they weren't quite the same because one had a six cylinder engine and one's got a four. But for the life of me I can't remember which is which. But uh, you'll see them both up there in the display area. Last year they actually featured in the official video of the show. We did a, a special little uh, subsection on the full control land rover. Now number 78 is the 1955 boat flatbed, Mr. White from Buxted in East Sussex. And you look at this, look, it's, it's 1955 I've got here, but the uh, the design of this one says it's, says it's a lot older than 1955 really. This, this is ultimate pre-war styling, this is. And um, we're looking at a vehicle here which was designed well before the war. And this is the Foden flatbed of the 1930s design, uh, owned by the White family from Buckstead in East Sussex. If you look on the back, you'll see in common with a number of these vehicles, it's got a, a figure in a round plate up on there on the back and this one's it's got a 30 on the back well that's not its fleet number that's its maximum speed 
this vehicle was actually allowed to do 30 miles an hour on the road and you don't go any faster because the policeman on his pedal cycle would clock you and give you a ticket for it. And now 1971 and this is the Land Rover fire engine, another one from Mr Hibbert's collection and there he is uh, with the uh, We get more and more hand signals here than, uh, than the average motorist on the M25. So 243 in your program. Mr. Hibbert from Fording Bridge. As I said, if you've got any questions, any if you'd like to know anything at all about forward control Land Rovers, he's the man to ask, the man in the fire engine there. Now, we were talking about ERF a little bit earlier. You won't find this one in your program, I don't think because this one's off the ERF display. The ERFs, of course, originally were very, very much a British concern. And you'll see where the ERF comes from, because this was the first vehicle off the production line up there at Sandbach. And you'll see the name on the front. It doesn't say ERF, it says ER Foden. And ER Foden was a member of the Foden family. Bones at this time were going through a bit of a con going through a little bit of a conflict. Uh, most of the family thought they could still make a living out of producing steam wagons, but uh, Edwin Foden decided that uh, really ought to be the future laid in diesel vehicles out there on the road. But he couldn't make the rest of the family agree to this, so he went his own way, opened his own factory up, a little bit up the road from the family firm, from Foden's and he started to produce the ERF. And this is the first one off the production line, but very, very fortunate, in fact, it didn't survive. There it is, in the arena here for you to see today. It'll be on display on the ERF stand next door to a scabble tent here at Dorset Steam Fair. And now, the 1952 Albion, we see once again, what Pre-war design, very much so, and undergoing restoration. Isn't this nice to see a vehicle that's still being rebuilt? Look at that brand new wooden bed there on the back. Nice to see someone who's taking the trouble to keep this part of his motoring heritage alive and preserving it so we can all see it and enjoy it where it belongs. Not just running around a rally field, but so many of these vehicles take, place in, uh, take part in road runs and drive them to and from events out on the road as well. This is the 1952 Albion. Mr. Bucknell from Didcot up there in Oxfordshire. It's nice to see the ongoing restoration of this vehicle. We look forward to seeing it down there at Dorset next year, totally pristine and finished. And now, here is almost the end of the story as far as the British ERF is concerned. Because these days, as I said earlier, we accept the fact that ERF was very much a British company. Well, it certainly was and it was very much one of the last independents to be taken over. It was taken over by MAN eventually, the Continental Vehicle Producer, who, in all fairness, are producing a very high quality, and were producing a very high quality vehicle, even before they took over ERF. But MAN have now taken over ERF. Quite recently, they shut down the old works in Sandbach, moved to a new factory, and assured everyone that production would continue in the UK. Well, things aren't always what we're told they are. And within 18 months of changing factories, MAN have now decided there will be no further ERF production in this country. And uh, so, once again, a firm that we are very familiar with on the road to this country, a British firm, has ceased to have a British base. And so, with that vehicle leaving the arena, really, we witnessed the end of the British ERF, which has run from the very early 1930s right through to this year. And now in 1963, it's the Austin van here, Mr. Lowe from Thompson, Southampton, and uh, Mr. Lowe purchased his vehicle to work it with his ironmongery business. They used to be down alongside the main road. They used to run right through Thompson before the new road went in. And he was just on the roundabout where you turned off the throttle through there, Mr. Lowe's eyes on tradition. And this particular vehicle was doing door-to-door paraffin deliveries from the very day that uh, Mr. Lowe brought it new. And he kept it, used it in conjunction with his business, right up until the time he retired. 
And when he retired, he took the vehicle with him. And he now used it to go around the rallies and the shows. And so this is restoration the way it should be, really. It's still with its original owner, still very much the way it was when Mr. Lowe was delivering power of him round the door. Number 39 now, and another Bedford K-type, but this one's a 1949 edition. And uh, it's one of the very early ones immediately after the war. Mr. Jones from Snodland in Kent, uh, with the, uh, or Mrs. Jones, it seems here, with a 1949 Bedford K-type. That's a little one and a half ton, 30 underweight carrying capacity. Bedford with the 28 horsepower petrol engine. And now 1974, and we're back to DRF. And this is the fire appliance. It's a water tender. Very delicately being manoeuvred round the arena here. It shows you how well mounted these vehicles are. You don't need muscles bulging out all over the place to drive one of these. Look, you can be good looking as well. And uh, here we have an example here as supplied to Derbyshire Fire Department. And this is the water tender, to, tender together with an escape ladder there on the top. And it's owned by the Thorpe family from Gainsborough in Lincolnshire. These fire appliances, of course, are rallied and preserved in full working condition. Very nice to see an ERF example. We don't see so many of them down this end of the country. Most of the fire appliances we see down this way are in the Dennis or uh, ABC. Bedford, we don't see so many in the ERF. Back to the Scamble again now, that's just the fifth, Scamble Genetic, with his 1967 version of the Scamble Highway. Still with the Gardner engine, because by this time you could actually have uh, the Gardner, uh, you, you could also have the Leyland engine, but this one is Gardner powered. And if you look at the back, you'll see the ballast body there on the back is very, very much after the style of a Pickford's ballast body. I don't know whether this is a restored Pickford's ballast body on the back or whether it's a, a copy, but it's an identical design to that employed by Pixwoods for their ballast bodies on the back of these little highwaymans when they use them for heavy horns. And now the 1967 Comma Motor Caravanet. Mr. Pritchard, from somewhere I assume it's in Wales, because it's one of those places that I can't possibly pronounce even without my teeth here this afternoon. And uh, this is the, the little Comma which uh, started life with a 1500cc engine and went up to a 1722 or thereabouts. And uh, they were quite a reliable vehicle. A little bit strange because the, the handbrake actually operated on the front wheels. And if you put it on rather quickly... Oh, that one works on the back, doesn't it? Well, we've got the deluxe model here. You won't, it won't, won't the front bumper won't it on the road when you put your handbrake on. But um, rather overbodied, you may think but very, very spacious living accommodation afforded. There were many thousands of these made, but so very few of them survive in the preservation. Very, very nice example there of the 1957 comma, the forward control comma, motor car the left. In fact, we don't see many of this type of comma in preservation in any shape or form, let alone with the car of body on it, which is unfortunate. 1951 now, and we're back to the Scamble Explorer. This is Mr. Harding from Alton in Hampshire. And you can see this one is in pretty well its original military format. RAF livery on here, so one of those vehicles that could well have been supplied to the RAF because they did use them for towing duties and winch duties on airfield as well. but still very, very much the bog standard Scammell Explorer recovery vehicle. Nothing extra there. Any? You see what I said before, the little crane wasn't a lot of use for recovery crane. In fact, it shows you there the main use that these little cranes got was actually lifting the spare wheel up and down. And the spare wheel carrier is fitted exactly as it would have been when it was in service there in conjunction with the uh, crane hook. But of course, military vehicles got bigger and heavier. And as time progressed, the thinking of the military designers went on greater things. And it, it didn't honestly get any bigger for a long, long time in this country than the Leyland Martian. And here we have the 1958 Leyland Martian uh, 
which is the coverage format here, which is quite unusual. There are so many of these markets preserved because initially they were provided, they were put in service with a great big petrol engine that nobody could possibly afford to run in preservation. And so uh, the majority of them have been re-engined in later life. But as you can see there in Remy colour, it's particularly particular crane vehicles you can see. Very, very much a specialist uh, recovery vehicle, but heavy duty crane vehicle here for bearing the badges of the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. And that of course is the Leyland Marsha. Principally remembered as a, an ar artillery tractor, but it did have two or three other uses for the armed services as well. And then we're back to Atkinson again, back into the 1950s. And this is what's known as the faux front Atkinson. You just look at the, the curve there on the front of the cab. Mr. Bexton from Colville, right up there in Leicestershire. And he's brought along this six-wheeler for us. First Atkinson six-wheeler that we've seen here this weekend. And as you see, the modern tow bar attachment there on the back is actually supported by its original tow hook, which is up on the, just below the, bed line at the back there by the 20 mile an hour restriction sign and uh, this would have been used for drawing a four wheel trailer on the back. A six wheeler like this would have been used for trunk work initially. Look at the length of the bed. It's got a very long bed and this would have had a, a four wheel dangler hanging on the back there going up the old A roads. So we're back before the, the days of motorways. We didn't have a motorway until 1959 in this country. So we're trunk hauling here with this vehicle with a trailer on the back. 1973 now, and we're back to the Atkinson border again. These were a very, very popular, very successful Arctic unit owned by Mr. Parsons of Rurden up there in Gloucestershire. Once again, restored correctly with the period sign writing and livery and artwork there on the side, just the way this vehicle would have been seen when it was out there working in the 1970s. And by this time too, sporting the fifth wheel articulated attachment there on the back, above the axle, we've moved away from the scabble coupling we saw on the three wheel scabble mechanical horse tractors earlier. There were two or three versions of articulated coupling available for a long time, but they were finally standardised with the fifth wheel setup that we see here on the Atkinson, just making its way out towards the, the gate there now at the end of the arena. And now for something slightly smaller and very, very much foreign in its design because it's the 1946 Dodge. Very nice little pickup truck. Once again from Coville up there in Leicestershire, Mr. Toogood. Nice to see him back again with this vehicle at the Great Dorset Steam Fair. Some regular exhibitor down here and a very nice example. This isn't flashed up in any way. This is the way this vehicle would have been in 1946. A very, very popular little vehicle over at Stateside. And it's what they call the, you notice the American design here, because the wheels are outside of the load space. The load space is in the little tin box in the back, and the wheels are outside there. It's what's known as the step side pickup truck. And now coming towards us, uh, 332, and uh, it's a laid down 3332, and I don't have any paperwork on it. <coughs> but I'm going to guess on this one and it's got a, a military history. I could be quite wrong, but I'm, I'm going to guess for military history. I've got a thumbs up, so we've got something right anyway today. But you can see it's got uh, that marvellous, uh, it's a six wheel drive too by the looks of it there. I think all, all actuals are live on the back. Yes, it's a six wheel drive, very much a military vehicle now. Here's where I'm going to stick my neck on the block and assume it would have been an airfield bowser of some description, a tanker possibly. Um, or of course it could have been a, a 10 ton uh, general service cargo truck when it was in service with the military. But certainly abroad because it's left hand drive and uh, very much a tropical cab with the extra air intakes etc. As well as the dustbin lid on the roof. And so we're looking at uh, very much uh, a vehicle for foreign service and uh, until I actually do find out the real history I'm hovering somewhere between the 10 ton general service truck uh, or an airfield bowser.
And now, coming up towards us, something much smaller indeed, 1948. And this is the Morris, it's the Y series Morris, Mr. Young from Heathfield in Sussex. Quite an unusual little vehicle, this one. It's the 10 hundredweight carrying capacity. Very, very similar in layout internally to the Ford because the engine comes back into the cab uh, to an extent. It's not quite as cramped inside as the Ford. The passenger's got a little bit more room. Although the engine is offset, as you can see from the position of the starting handle, as it sticks out through one side of the grill at the front. But this is a very reliable little vehicle, mechanically superior to the 10 horsepower Ford, and uh, very hard work little vehicles indeed, the Morris van. They came out in a slightly different form before the war, were manufactured as Tillys and light service vehicles for the armed services through the war, and were available for a short time immediately post-war. And this is the 1948 version of the Series Y Morris van. Now 1953, and this is very much military specification again, is the Austin K9 four-wheel drive tipper, Mr. Green from East Wellow, down the road in Hampshire on the edge of the new forest there. The type of vehicle that would possibly have survived down there on timber work, one would have guessed. But um, a very nice example, you can see it's uh, picked up a tipping body later on in life. And of course, this is what a commercial vehicle is all about. Commercial vehicles are vehicles designed to do a job of work. And sometimes their lifetime should be extended by adding different body styles, uh, bodies for different jobs, and different specifications onto the vehicles. And this in itself is uh, illustrated here by the 1959 Rio Turberg, which you've seen making its way towards us now. Mr. Adderley from Mitchell Diva is the proud owner of this particular beast that's making its way towards us. Because this is once again a military vehicle, or it started life as a military vehicle, but it, uh, it wasn't with us, it was them. It was that lot that was over here when they should have been over there, if you see what I mean. It's an American vehicle, uh, built very, very much to the American military specification originally, but since then, as you can see, ever so slightly customised to, <laughs> to its condition at the moment. And it's owned by Mr. Adderley from Mitchell Diva, and he's got a, a very serviceable in, uh, ballast tractor indeed there, complete with its own generating unit up there on the back. Just the sort of thing that any showman or any completely self-sufficient traveller would be pleased to own. And that's the 1959 originally Rio Ballast Tractor. Any way up will do, it doesn't matter. It's that man again. And there we... That's what he, wa he wants you to stand on your head. Driving this particular vehicle, ladies and gentlemen, this is the man now if there's anything the matter with this parade, it's all his fault. This is uh, David, who's in charge of this section, is actually having a little run round in John Hall Atkinson. And this isn't the Borderer. No, it's the eight-legger, isn't it? It's the eight-wheeler, the eight-wheeler rigid. It's the Atkinson Black Knight, dating from 1966. Mr. Hall from Leeds. And you can see, every year he comes down to Dorset, and every year, part of our arena parades and uh, very much part of the scene down here and the vehicle that is brought down from Leeds in 1966 Atkinson Black Knight in the authentic livery of Holt Lane Transport as it would have been at that time and now 1973 now when my when my paperwork staff was going through this earlier, they said, what's a mail coach doing in here? Obviously had visions of something with horses on the front. But of course, in America, things like, in, uh, sorry, in Switzerland, the mail is carried on a coach, and uh, they also perform rural district bus services along with mail delivery. So there's more and more than, than meets the eye to this one, isn't there? I, I think I'm wasting my time in here. I should be out there in the coast. But these are some of our Dutch visitors from the Netherlands over here, obviously enjoying the great Dorset Steam Fair. And this is the Sora Swiss Mail Coach, uh, all the way from the Netherlands 
over here with us this this summer. And I would assume they're probably touring the steam fairs, but they're certainly enjoying themselves here. And they're giving, they've got to do it, haven't they? They've seen the scammers do it, so they can do it with a bus as well. We're getting a demonstration of maneuverability in the Sora Swiss Mail Well, that's the Swiss Mobile Disco making its way over the arena now. Uh, a little bit earlier, we saw the Morris 1000 weight van. Well, this, in effect, is the Ford opposition to that vehicle. This one dates from the same year, 1948, although as the same as the Morris, this particular vehicle did actually come out pre-war. And this is the 1948 Ford to pick up. It's the uh, little 10 hundredweight version. 10 horsepower side valve engine, half ton carrying capacity. Very many of these were converted vans, but some were built as pickups to start with. There were three different versions of the pickup actually, but it's not always easy to tell which were converted in later life from the vans vans which uh, the bodies did suffer quite a bit and they were able to be resurrected and continued uh, effectively with a pickup body. 293 now and we're back to 1966. Scammell Highwayman again. Mr Walker from Bishop's Auckland up there in County Durham. And you can see this one is slightly different to all the other scammels we've seen so far. It's got smaller mudguards on the front. And this goes to tell you a little bit about it, because with those small mudguards on the front, it's probably been used as a heavy haulage tractor from a very early date. And now the 1972 Scammell uh, Atkinson Borderer, sorry, Mr. Bexton from Colville again, getting a lot from Colville going around the arena today. Hope they're enjoying their visit down here to Dorset. And a very nice example absolutely correctly presented the way a vehicle of this type would have been when it was out there on the road. What would a thousand pounds buy you today? It certainly wouldn't buy you this beautiful Atkinson bow front here, the Bexton uh, Colville, the Atkinson recovery vehicle that's going past us. This one dates from 1955. This is a beautifully presented and uh, very well restored little recovery vehicle, the 1955 Atkinson. Very nice example, with its original registration too, that's so nice to see a vehicle retaining its previous history in its entirety there. Now another one of our old regulars. Is it the old regular? Yes, it's the old regular, the lorry and Len. 1937 Leyland here, and it's Len Watts, all the way from Dorchester, and uh, a regular exhibitor here at the Great Dorset Steam Fair. Len's been supporting this event now ever since day one with vehicles of one sort or another. And you can see by the state of him, he's really enjoying himself here at the show from the 1937 Leyland. The 1939 now, and vehicles of this type uh, were vehicles which served tremendously well for us during the Second World War because this is a 1939 Leyland Cub fire engine. It's owned by Mr. Land from Columpton down there in Devon. And as you can see, it says Budley Sources and Urban District Council there on the side. This vehicle was source service right down there in Devon and uh, throughout those difficult days of the Second World War. And now moving on 30 years to the Bedford J1 drop side, Mr. Wenham from Walton on Thames. I said these little vehicles were much loved by our itinerant community, didn't I? Well, this is uh, a vehicle of that type, and you can see here that uh, Mr. Wenham very much he brought us along some of the real history, so I don't have to make it up today. Oh yes, I remember this one. He brought it round last year, and. Uh, it's had a, a former owner's here, they're a little bit posh this vehicle. Don't forget to doff your caps when it goes past the arena because this vehicle was formerly owned by Viscount Newport in the Earl of Bedford. Back to Scammells again now in 1967. Still with the Gardner engine, proudly shown off there. And uh, this is Mr Watson from Holbrook, right up in Cumbria.
Now I've got a got a slight feeling that this is a gentleman who encountered a problem on the way down here to uh, this uh, to this show. I've, I've got a, an awful feeling he had a little bit of a little bit of a shunt on the way down. Not his fault. Slow moving vehicles are not always appreciated as such by the modern day drivers. When you're going home down the motorways, please remember that our enthusiasts take their vehicles home on the same roads as you use. And don't go driving up the backs of their caravans like somebody in a transit van did to Mr. Holt, Mr. Watson on his way down to the show here. Mr. Watson's having to live in a tent because somebody smashed his caravan to pieces on his way down to the show. Well, as the scammer goes towards the exit, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt John Collins again. Uh, sadly to say that uh, we've run out of time here at the Dorset Steam Fair and it's only left for me, Barry Heard, to say goodbye and I hope you've enjoyed the show. Any transit drivers out there, please remember, some vehicles go slower than you do.